Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the American Library in Paris virtual evenings with an author series. I'm Catherine Olin, Programs Manager at the American Library. For just to say a few things about us, for those of you who aren't familiar with our institution, um, we're the largest English language lending library on the continent, something we're extremely proud of. Um, but we're not just a place for books and periodicals and different resources, we're also a space for engagement and community events and wonderful author talks uh, like, like this one tonight. And we, we are continuing virtually for the time being, just to make sure that everybody's safe. But we're so glad with your continued engagement that you're showing up for these events and joining us in the Zoom room throughout this sort of strange period. So thank you really for being here. Uh, the American Library in Paris is also a nonprofit institution. So we're completely independent. We don't receive uh, government funding from the French or US governments. That means we rely uh, to a tremendous degree on donors and we're very, very grateful for their support and for everybody's generosity within our community. I wanted to mention also, it's a very special year for us. So 2020 is our centennial. Uh, we've been around for 100 years now, and we have quite an impressive legacy. We've been celebrating for the past few months, even through the period of confinement. Um, it's been wonderful to see your support. And of course, we do have the Century Gala coming up, and that's on October 8th. And you can find more information about that on our homepage. And if you're interested in attending, then please do, do have a look at that. Um, you can also learn more about us generally through our website or homepage, our Facebook page, Instagram page, we're on Twitter as well, we're basically everywhere. And we also have a bi-weekly e-newsletter called eLibris. So if you're not already subscribed, you can go ahead and subscribe and keep up to date on all of our wonderful events and library news in general. All right, so this evening I'm really, really pleased to be joined by Tony Minetti. He is the author of two novels and two nonfiction books, including Shooting Belibo, the memoir of uh, his reporting on the East Timor conflict. He's Australian by birth with an Anglo-Greek background, which he'll be telling us a lot more about tonight, I believe. And he's worked for the Australian Broadcasting Company, BBC, among others. Uh, he's officially living in Paris now. He was in the South before, but he's recently moved up to Paris here, um, where he's at work on his uh, next novel, which is called Angels Look Away. And that will be taking us to the turbulent world of Greek refugees from Asia Minor in the 1920s. And I should also mention that Tony is a member of the library. So it's, it's always wonderful to have a community member come up and share his work. And you might even see him around the space once everybody's, you know, sort of circulating back within the library. So thank you so much for being here, Tony. Thanks, Catherine. Um, wonderful to be here. And thank you, everybody, for joining in wherever you are in this crazy new world we're living in. Um, Look, uh, where to start this talk? Uh, I, I thought I might begin with something from 1965, um, which was another planet from the one we're living on today, even though it was only 50 years ago. Um, that's when the, the celebrated New Yorker film critic Pauline Kael published a collection of um, cinema reviews with the wonderful title, I Lost It at the Movies. Uh, this, of course, has several colloquial meaning, meanings in English. Uh, uh, I lost my naivety, my innocence by watching the movies, or um, I became completely immersed in the movies, uh, lost in the world of cinema, or, or of course, perhaps less respectfully, um, I lost my virginity to whatever degree in the back row of the movie theater, uh, as indeed in another era many did. There is a, a potential inversion of this title. I found it at the movies. The movies shaped my worldview. The movies gave me what I was looking for but couldn't find in real life. Uh, the movies helped develop my persona and my worldview. And I think that's true of many people, um, millions perhaps. It's certainly true in my case. The cinema and the movies led me first to photography uh, and then into journalism, television journalism, uh, then into writing fiction and also into, into screenwriting. In a sense, uh, I think the movies created me, uh, not only the writer I am, but the person I became. And I'm not alone in this, I'm sure. I think for most of us, we'd all be quite different people without the movies. When I was uh, preparing this talk, I, I mentioned the subject to my neighbor, who happens to be a professor at the, at the Sabon. I said I, I would try to describe my life 
through the movies from the uh, cartoon character Daffy Duck all the way through to the sublime mysteries of someone like Antonioni. And she said, uh, oh, may we, uh, of course, uh, Daffy Duck, Antonioni, and your mother in the middle. <laughs> I'm still not sure what she meant by that. Uh, I did have a mother, of course, a wonderful mother, but it got me thinking too that perhaps my other mother was in fact the vastness and the depth of the cinema itself. The movies that really gave birth to my creativity. As a kid, I didn't read books. I, I just watched movies. I grew up in uh, subtropical Australia, which is about as far as you can get from where I am tonight uh, here in Paris. Uh, my father was a Greek immigrant uh, and my mother was an Anglo-Saxon beauty. After the war, they, they married and uh, ran fish and chip shops and fruit shops and uh, corner stores. I used to play in the store. I went to school, of course. Uh, I was a typical 1950s kid with not a lot of toys and not much to do, frankly. Uh, and so I needed one big escape. And what was that? Of course, the movies. Every Saturday at one o'clock, I would rush to the movie theater, the matinee screening, two Hollywood adventures plus cartoons. I'd return to the family store at five o'clock, full of celluloid dreams. Uh, and at eight o'clock, I'd return to the same cinema and watch two adult features with my parents. So as a kid, I saw a lot of movies. I knew the inside of the local cinema as well as my own bedroom. Four films every week, 50 weeks a year, uh, 200 movies a year, <laughs> 10 years of this nonstop, 2000 movies. And when television arrived, rather than replace the movies, it simply added more and more to the list the midday movie on TV, the after school kids movie, the evening movie, and still those four real movies at the cinema every Saturday night, which were occasionally peppered with a little grit or spice to suggest life wasn't always that tough and things might even turn out well. Nearly always they conform to the classic three act model of storytelling, the calm beginning, the complicated middle and the satisfying end. Or as the screenwriters like to say, set it up, mess it up, and then fix it up. Well, of course, if only life was that simple. These movies, I think, helped to shape an entire generation and not always for the better. Uh, in 1955, when I was six years old, something quite extraordinary happened to me. After a steady, a steady uh, diet of matinees of Daffy Duck and Superman and too much Coca-Cola, uh, I returned one night for the evening movie with my parents and the screen lit up. There was music, sensuous music, and a man and a woman were dancing, or rather they were moving around each other, circling each other's bodies with desire, getting closer and closer. Kim Novak and William Holden, a film called Picnic. She in the pink chiffon dress, perfect complexion, he all muscles and scarred by life, and they dance in a way that I've never seen before. I'm six, and yes, I'm in love, not only with Kim Novak in pink chiffon, but with the screen itself, the possibilities of cinematic passion. Up to then, I thought of cinema as the flicks, somewhere to have a lot of fun. But this was different. This was what adults called the movies. Moving, a kind of sensuous dream. Picnic was in fact one of the top Hollywood box office attractions when the Cold War was in full swing. It was based on a hit Broadway play of the same name by William Inge. And in the first act, it uh, confirmed that life in middle America in the American Midwest in the 1950s was the model we all needed to follow. White picket fences, good-hearted, hard-working people, and here looking forward to their annual summer picnic. And then comes trouble. 
the dangerous drifter, William Holden, arrives on the Rattler and captures the eye of the young Kim Novak, who's already betrothed to a wealthy local guy. As with all great drama, conflict ensues, driven by passion, uh, especially during that smoldering dance in the moonlight down by the river. Kim is torn between responsibility and desire. Hmm? Will she wake up in time and heed her mother's warnings and marry the nice guy? Or will she follow her heart, her uncontrolled passion, and run off with a crazy no-hoper who's steamy as all hell? Well, I won't spoil the outcome, <laughs> only to say my heart was beating pretty fast to the very end. I was only six, but I, I just couldn't wait to grow up and wreck my life, just like Kim Novak and William Holden were doing. I've often wondered why this film, Picnic, has stayed in my brain for so long. And I think, well, beyond the obvious boyhood fascination with anything sexual, um, it boils down to a fairly simple equation, to stay or to go. That's Kim's great dilemma in the film. Uh, do you stick with what you have in life, the security and comforts you enjoy, or do you break out and uh, escape into the unknown? So many of the films that influence us, I think, uh, that cause us to reflect on our lives are built around this very human dilemma. How far can we stretch before we break? Hmm? How dangerous is it to leave rather than stay? Or is it better not to start at all? Is going only halfway the worst of all possible worlds? And this for me really is where film started to connect with life. What is it to be human? In many ways, that's the underlying question of all creativity. We love and we suffer what is very precious to us. We could walk away, but we don't. And perhaps that's what grips us to the earth we stand on, this desire to comprehend the human situation we find ourselves in. Either that or we do walk away out to the edge where you see things you can't see in the middle. Well, sitting in the cinema with my mother and father that night watching Picnic, I wasn't thinking all this at the age of six, of course, but the seed was being planted. Uh, so we jump now perhaps to the 1960s. I've left high school and I've landed a journalism cadetship in television and radio news with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. I'm still watching a lot of movies, uh, but they're different movies. They're new wave French films, um, tough Hollywood gangster films, uh, gritty British movies about politics and social change, uh, driven by rock music and drugs. It's the 60s. Uh, at night, I'm also starting to write short stories, and by day, I'm chasing fire engines for a living. So that's my life. But importantly, I think then, um, the movies I'm watching and the things I'm writing about, and in fact, the life I'm living, seem to be drawing closer together. They're no longer separate entities, but they're shaping the person I'm becoming. Something else of importance here, in 1968, I traveled to Greece for the first time. Uh, even though I'm half Greek, I've never set foot then in my father's land, or indeed anywhere outside Australia. A year earlier, the uh, Greek people had woken up to find they were living in a military dictatorship. They said it could never happen again in Europe, but it did. And uh, a bunch of mad colonels had rounded up their opponents and terrorized the Greek people for seven long years. For a few months, I lived in that world, the glory of the Aegean summer, coexisting with fear and torture. And while I was there, Russian tanks also invaded Czechoslovakia. This was 1968. Earlier in that year, the French government had almost been toppled by the, the May student riots here in Paris. So in all this, there was a, a kind of rawness, I guess, I'd never experienced in Australia. And it made me want to be not only a journalist, but a foreign correspondent. 
either that or a novelist who, uh, whose books would convey the very turmoil of this international sphere. And I was also exploring my Greek identity, the half of me that I had suppressed growing up in Australia with very strong American influences. The journey inevitably brought me to Greek cinema, um, or the Greek cinema I could watch because I couldn't speak much Greek, it had to be in English, which pretty much limited me to two films. The first, Never on Sunday, was a light-hearted romp around Piraeus with a prostitute played dynamically, magnetically, by Melina Makuri, the wonderful Melina Makuri, uh, written and directed by her French husband, Jules de Saint. It captured in black and white what I imagined then was the Greek spirit, living life to the full, robustly, independently. That was also true in a less boisterous, perhaps, and more philosophical manner to the second film, Zorba the Greek, based on Nikos Kazantakis's great novel and directed by Michael Kakoyanis, and of course starring Anthony Quinn famously as Zorba the Greek. Both of these films uh, were infectious in their own way, uh, and this Greek influence that had shaped, started to shape me uh, took more serious holds in the depths of an Aegean winter in 1984. When I found the house where my father was born, and I, I traced his journey, his traumatic journey as a refugee out of Greece. That old question again, to stay or to go. What I was doing, I think, was transplanting this Greek cinematic spirit into my own writing. And initially, in a, in a short story, which I called The Walls Remain the Same, and then, which I expanded into my second novel, Smyrna. In a way, I think I was shooting my own Greek movie in my head. And in reality, I was still planning a move from journalism into screenwriting. Across these life changes, my father George was a constant inspiration. Zorba-like in his own way, staunchly independent, a social loner. He told me once, you can say, I'm tough and I can prove it to anybody but it counts much more when you say, I'm tough and I don't have to prove it to anybody. That was really his philosophy. He answered to no one. <laughs> in everything he did, my, my dad was very much his own man. And in that sense, very Greek. The real depths of his Greekness came to be much later, uh, 40 years later, in fact, when I first saw the films of Theo Angelopoulos made across the years 1970 to 2008. Some critics say watching Angelopoulos movies is like watching paint dry. They are slow, often revolving around historical themes in the modern Greek state, and they're incredibly silent, but in a way that thought and reflection in village communities are also slow and silent, aware that too many words too much babbling on, too much bragging in George's eyes can get in the way of meaning. The best uh, Angelopoulos films, I think, the masterpieces like The Travelling Players, Ulysses Gaze, An Eternity in a Day, they carry a deep sense of displacement, of migration from one culture to another, and ultimately often of loss. There are no happy endings, but the characters emerge stronger for their trials and more human. In the, the novel I've recently completed, Angels Look Away, I've tried to capture these themes and atmospheres um, to give a sense not only of the beauty and pleasure of Greece, but also the, the pain of being Greek. Um, as the poet, poet George Seferis said, uh, wherever I go, Greece wounds me. That's not a, a malicious comment, but an honest one. Just as with humans, I think, uh, the love you can feel for a place can also involve a lot of pain. If I hadn't read Seferis's poetry, and equally, if I hadn't seen Angelopoulos's films, I don't think my writing now would have evolved into what it is. 
Uh, perhaps to illustrate that, I'll, I'll read a short passage from the manuscript of Angels Look Away, and maybe you'll detect some cinematic influences. I carry with me a folding map of the world. It's oddly made, as if the planet can be turned into a book, a sphere with no beginning and no end. The half moon pages are filled with nations and oceans. They open like an accordion to create a globe. And then you can see the entire world, our beautiful cosmos, its skin cracked, defeated, alive, suffering always. Every nation carries a bright color against blue seas so that the world seems more like a carnival balloon than the harsh, cruel sphere known to explorers and peasants as Earth. The map has been mine since I stole it, an act of defiance more than theft. I won't be held back, too late for that. The world is mine to conquer. Yanis Stratos, thief in the service of humanity. Stuffing the map into my shirt, I feel my chest expanding. The planet's riches and its cities, New York, Paris, Berlin, London, filling my head. I'm trying to decide where to spend my life to become the person I want to be. I'm lost, but those images persist. But also, I don't care, because my brain hasn't hardened into adulthood. It's still vulnerable, and into that softness, I press dangerous ideas. Now I'll uh, turn perhaps to one of the key events of my life, one that would become the ultimate convergence for me of cinema and writing. In 1975, I was 26, and I was sent with a television crew into a war zone, not Vietnam, which had recently ended, but a dusty Portuguese outpost just north of Australia called East Timor. A revolution in Portugal had left chaos there in its numerous colonies, and in Timor itself, the civil war that followed had produced ugly scars and political uncertainty. The neighboring Indonesians wanted to grab the colony, but the left-wing forces in Timor were demanding independence. And so a major conflict seemed inevitable. We set out for the border with Indonesia to report what was happening, and quickly we came under shelling, heavy fire. As we retreated, another five television journalists from Australia arrived, and less than a week later, they were all dead, murdered in cold blood by the invading forces. The group became known as the Balabo Five, after the village where they died. So I emerged from that experience shaken, unsure if I really wanted to stay in television journalism or shift into fiction and screenwriting full time. Again, this, this problem, to stay or to go. Across the 1980s, I did some of both, in fact, uh, and I spent three years here in Paris. <laughs> there I am uh, in the Luxembourg Gardens, uh, writing my second novel and also covering European affairs following the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was uh, an all absorbing kind of double life, fiction and fact, uh, until I decided I had had enough of television journalism. So in 1993, I returned to Sydney and I entered the Australian Film and Television School to study screenwriting properly. And there I met a young film director called Robert Connolly, who was very eager to make a movie about the East Timor affair and the deaths of the five journalists. That film would ultimately be made, Balibo, but first we had to wait another 15 years <laughs> until the, the country, the former colony, now occupied by Indonesia, gained its independence. I was asked to be an advisor on the film and I decided in parallel to write a memoir of my time there in 1975, as well as the time I spent in 2008 working on the film. The result was shooting Balibo, Blood and Memory in East Timor. And because of the, the film tie-in, I had to complete the book in only four months, undoubtedly 
the most intense writing experience of my life. It almost killed me. Uh, towards the end of it, I wrote, they say we've only got one war in us, and my days in Timor were enough to teach me many things, not least that experience in the house of conflict is expanded, and the exhilaration of war, once felt, can never be replicated in everyday life. That risk goes hand in hand with raw beauty. That life is never so intense as it is or was in that compression of life called war. And added to this, the terrible sense that despite all our reporting efforts, nothing we did could stop the impending doom. Much earlier uh, in 1984, I'd written a first novel based on these events too. It was called The Children Must Dance. So the story had been swirling around my head for literally decades. In all this, um, I haven't yet mentioned a key event that happened immediately after I withdrew to Australia from East Timor in 1975. For my own protection, I was told to simply disappear for a while. Uh, so I spent empty days wandering around Sydney, where I lived, and one hot afternoon I wandered into an art cinema, and not even sure what I was about to see. The film turned out to be The Passenger, regarded by many critics as Michelangelo Antonioni's masterpiece, and starring Jack Nicholson in what he, Jack Nicholson, has considered his finest ever performance. Had it been called by its original title, Professione Reporter, I might have been prepared for what came next. The film begins with an encounter between two men somewhere in Africa. Nicholson plays David Locke, an American British TV reporter covering a small and ill-defined war. He says to another European man he meets called Robertson, you seem unusually poetic for a businessman. And Robertson replies, do I? In fact, he's not who he claims to be. He's someone and something entirely different. And immediately here, Antonioni hurls us into the old question of identity. Who am I really? When Robertson dies suddenly of a heart attack, Locke decides to assume his identity in order to escape his own identity, that of celebrity television reporter, the very identity that Locke is tired of and that no longer makes any sense to him. What he doesn't know is that Robertson was in fact not a businessman, but a gun runner for rebel groups in Africa and that their enemies want Robertson dead. Later, Locke tells the girl he meets I've just sold 5,000 hand grenades, 900 rifles, and a great deal of ammunition to some people fighting a secret war in an obscure part of the world. His life is turned on its head. No longer the detached objective reporter, he's up to his neck in the story, pursued by men with guns, and he can't get out. The only escape appears to be death, which he, he seems to be courting. The Passenger is a film where a lot seems to happen, yet not a lot actually happens. It's full of holes that Antonioni has placed there deliberately for us to fill with our own thoughts, our own fears and desires to escape the world we normally inhabit. It's a movie about escapism, but it's not an escapist movie in the Hollywood sense. We don't watch to be entertained or even informed. We watch it and think about our own lives, our own state of being. Well, for me, of course, the entire film was actually a replay of what I had just experienced, the fighting I had covered, uh, the nearness of death and the traumas of identity I was going through, and the question of what to do next. The New Yorker critic Penelope Gilliatt called The Passenger a study of a bleached out man for whom everything is estranging. And that's exactly what I felt at that moment, having survived conflict and emerging from the cinema more shaken than when I went in. The feeling was actually quite surreal, as if Antonioni had been aware of my situation, of my recent history. And what made it even stranger was that 
I was the only person in the cinema. In an interview at the time, uh, Antonioni talked about using both action and intellectual ideas together. They push me to do something and behave in a way I don't understand, he said. It's unconscious, I can't explain. This, of course, is a very existential view, uh, one that doesn't attempt to define the reasons why. In fact, it's the antithesis of most Hollywood filmmaking, where everything was and still is largely explained. All the loose ends are nicely tied up and life returns to normal, which of course it never really does. And in these coronavirus times, I think uh, we'll probably never do so, perhaps least of all in America. Even though it's 45 years old now, The Passenger strikes me as being very much of this moment in the world, a time when there is no certainty, um, there is no normal, and the very fundamentals of our identity, individual, social, national, are shaky to say the least. We are all being forced to swap our old identities for new ones, but uh, we still have no idea really what those new ones will be. And try as hard as we might to see this as the possibility of a fresh start. We are clouded by uncertainties about what to do next, what will happen next. In other words, I think the film we've created out of the chaotic material of our 21st century lives is one with no clear ending. Another of the screenwriter's big dilemmas, not only where to start, but where and how to finish. The point of entry, but importantly, the point of exit. So I'll wrap up now with reference to one more seminal film. Le Quatre Sans Coup, The 400 Blows, the beginning of Francois Truffaut's sublime cinematic journey across the human landscape. And I think for many people, including me, a defining moment in seeing and understanding the powerful link between cinema and life. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, this Truffaut classic, the start of the so-called Antoine Doniel cycle in which the actor Jean-Pierre Léo more or less plays himself as he develops into adulthood too. The 400 Blows is in fact the story of Truffaut's own troubled childhood and it compresses Antoine's life as a boy into 99 minutes and not one of them is wasted. So desperate is his character Antoine Doniel to write his passion to create an identity just by writing his story that he steals a typewriter and gets caught. Truffaut, of course, was himself a writer, a film critic turned filmmaker. And he too fell into trouble with the French authorities as a kid. In the famous uh, final sequence, Antoine is on the run, fleeing from his captors and towards, well, towards what? What does the future hold for Antoine Doniel? or indeed for any of us. Truffaut captures this perfectly. Antoine escapes and runs to the edge of the sea. And at the last moment, when he can go no further, he turns and stares directly into the lens. And that's it. In some way, this decisive moment in cinema boils down to a simple proposition that unlike many Hollywood movies, life is not played out in neat, acts, of three acts, that life is messy and unpredictable, that just when we fix it up, someone or something appears unexpectedly and throws the ending into chaos or a vacuum. And often that vacuum in particular is the very thing that makes the story. We leave the cinema unsure of what we've experienced or what we feel, and with more than a touch of uncertainty about our own lives. This, uh, this journey from certainty to uncertainty is also felt by any serious writer as they move through life and through the writing of their books. What you're doing, I think, is moving further from the templates you've experienced and absorbed in those early years and um, into spaces where there are no templates, where there are no strictures, no rules, uh, but there's liberation. Or as Andre Gide says, the novel is lawless. And you have the confidence then, perhaps, 
to make it not only anything you want it to be, the novel, but to let the novel itself take you where it wants to go. Um, it's, the, it's the canvas telling Picasso what it wants him to paint, uh, or it's the, the stone telling Rodin where to place the next blow of the hammer, transcending everything that's gone before. And when it's like this, cinema too becomes art, I think. It, it tells us truths about ourselves, and it, in turn, it influences other forms of creativity, including literature. The road uh, to and from Hollywood is long for all of us. Uh, yes, we've all traveled on that road. On the way in, we suspended disbelief for the simple childhood pleasures of westerns and cartoons and slapstick comedy and shallow romances. And further down the yellow brick road, well into adulthood, we found ourselves surrounded by and often attempting to escape the plastic world of franchise movies and repetitive plots and lines that we'd heard a hundred times before, a thousand times. Uh, one move and you're dead, right? Uh, I don't know why I love you like I do. And uh, that most demeaning of all lines repeated in a thousand movies spoken by apparently helpless women standing beside heroic male figures. What are we going to do now? Well, indeed, what will we all do now? If we were smart, we might turn to the masters of cinema to explore their works and discover what humanity is really about. It's about depth of character, complexity of emotions. It's about human anxiety and unpredictability in stories on the screen. It's not unlike life in 2020 itself. And after that, well, who knows? Thanks a lot. And um, Catherine, perhaps we've got some questions. I don't know. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tony, for this wonderful journey. Well illustrated, richly illustrated journey. Thank you. And yes, as Tony has indicated, um, please do send your questions via the chat feature at this moment and we'll get to you as many as we can. All right, um, the first one has already come in actually from Clydette who says, thanks for this inspiring visual information rich and personal presentation. How did you approach the task of writing Shooting Bolibo in four months? <laughs> right, <laughs> uh, basically by locking myself in a, in a room and ignoring my family and, and uh, respons other responsibilities. I was actually at the time lecturing uh, in journalism at a university and they very kindly gave me the time off to write the book. Um, it, 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 it sort of was part of a program which ended up in me getting a, a doctorate. So the book became part of that process. Um, but it was very intense. And unfortunately, it, um, it went from October through to January. So it also took in Christmas and New Year, which the, in Australia, of course, is summertime and the family had to uh, suffer my, my disappearance. But uh, I got it done and um, I think it worked very well uh, for everybody. I, I was pleased with the result and, and so were the publishers. Mm. All right, great. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is from Stephen, who says, your presentation was a masterclass in storytelling. Thank you. Uh, the question is, are you writing any screenplays at the moment? Uh, not directly at the moment. I'm, I'm finishing up the last novel. Uh, but I, like most screenwriters, I have about four or five half finished screenplays and a couple of finished ones that, that unfortunately never got produced. Um, it's, it, it's a fact unknown to most people that for every movie you see, there are probably a thousand screenplays sitting in drawers that didn't get made. So it's a, it's a very thankless um, profession, screenwriting. Uh, everyone tries very hard to get their film up and films take such a long time and such a lot of money and effort to get up, uh, which inevitably pushes you back to wanting to write a novel, which you have total control over. You get the thing done, you put it out there, it's finished. Um, but I, I do have two or three uh, films on the boil, so to speak, yeah. Uh, one of which uh, I'm, I'm very excited about, but um, just wait and see what happens with that, yeah. And of course, at the moment, it's very hard for anybody in the film industry, given the, the whole coronavirus crisis. Uh, production has largely stopped in, in Australia, in America. Um, it's, it's picking up in Europe a little, but uh, everybody's uh, raiding the back 
the backlog of, of product and, and waiting for something to happen next year. And I saw a very interesting thing in the New York Times a couple of days ago where uh, you might be familiar with this very popular series called The Blacklist. It's been going now for eight seasons and they got almost to the end of the final show in the season and, and had to stop shooting it. And they thought, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So uh, they decided to finish it off with animation. And <laughs> they start off with human drama, real, real life drama, and ends with animation, which is quite a breakthrough in thinking. So people are trying to find all sorts of ways around this uh, problem of how to be, keep up their creativity in, in such a, a global crisis, but it's not easy. Absolutely, it's been an amazing time for innovation. I, I agree with you. Uh, the next question is from Ida, who says, your new, your new book is about Greece, which is also the land where your father came from. Did you manage to learn Greek? And uh, did that help in your writing, if so? <laughs> uh, look, unfortunately, I can't say that I've learned Greek. I do have some Greek, but it's, it's just a little bit above tourist level Greek. Uh, my, uh, the situation was very, un, uh, very unusual. My father came from Greece and almost immediately wanted to become an Australian and to leave the past behind. And by marrying an Australian, Anglo-Australian, uh, we didn't speak Greek at home. Uh, he wasn't religious. We didn't go to the Greek church or Greek school. So I missed out as a child. And then throughout my adult life, I've, I've attempted on about four or five occasions to start courses in Greek and uh, have failed quite miserably. It's, it's not an easy language. And I think at this age, I'm, I'm focusing on my French. Thanks. I think that sounds reasonable. Um, Claudette has another question. So are there films you would suggest to help us through our current age of uncertainty? Mm, boy, that's hard. That's hard. Um, in some ways, there's a whole range of films. I mean, I wrote down a few ideas here. You know, every film in a way can, can help you out of uncertainty, depending on what you're looking for. I think... Um, uh, I tell you a film I do like that, that is a very powerful film. I, I like the films of Terence Malick. I don't know if you know his work. He started off with Badlands and he did a couple of um, great films, including The Thin Red Line, uh, a war film, which is, is very poetic and very um, um, uh, cerebral in a way, uh, actually filmed in Australia passing for the Japanese, um, the Pacific Islands in the Japanese American War. Um, but a film called The Tree of Life he made, which is a very interesting film about uh, people reassessing their values in a time of turmoil and crisis. So that's something, The, the Tree of Life. Um, I like the films of Paul Thomas Anderson, um, There Will Be Blood, is a great movie, uh, again, you know, it's hard to say that that represents anything we can relate to with COVID, but in a way it does. It's about, you know, fighting to survive, to stay alive, to get what you want in, in a time of difficulty. Um, yeah, look, it, you know, there, there are hundreds of films out there. I, I often find myself in these times of crisis, in the last six months anyway, um, going back to new wave French cinema. I mean, I love watching the, the, the lighter films of Truffaut, you know, all, all those Antoine Doniel films and, uh, and some of the other new wave people. I recently saw Breathless, um, about the Souf again. Uh, fantastic to watch this stuff. It's inspirational in, in a creative sense anyway. And that, that helps me get out of the, the mood of despair about what's happening in the world right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think you've, uh, you've given us all a good place to start. So now we have a lot of homework to do. Everybody, I hope, had time to jot down all of the titles. <laughs> um, so we have another question from Deborah now, who says, thanks so much for the talk. As a fellow Greek, I know what you mean. I know what you were speaking about, how the country haunts and inspires no matter where one has moved to. Would you think about telling the story of 1968 to 74? Um. I, I haven't um, thought about that, Deborah, uh, but it's, 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 it, it's, it's a powerful story. And uh, I do have some connections through family with, you know, the, the negative side of that and what went wrong. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a terrible indictment, really, uh, not of Greece, but, uh, but of Western society, that such a thing could have happened in 67 to 74, that, you know, literally the Greeks 
went to sleep one night in April 1967 and they woke up the next morning and there were tanks on every corner and the military had taken over the country. Well, you couldn't imagine that happening in France now or Britain, but it happened in Greece, a European country. Um, it's a very powerful um, metaphor almost for what could still happen in the world anywhere right now too. I think, you know, there's a rising sense of uncertainty and uh, a shift to the right in many political situations and uh, rumors and, and movements in, in military circles about, you know, are civilians capable of running their own society? So frightening thought, but um, yeah, great material for, for a book and a movie. Um, there have been books and movies written, but uh, personally, no, I don't think I could go there. I, uh, I don't know enough about it. And I don't, I don't feel, I think you would have to have lived through it in Greece, perhaps to write that book. Yeah. Okay, great. And if anybody, up, oh, Deborah has a second question she's just added. So have you seen Meteora, a 2012 film? It's a beautifully, uh, uh, it's part animation. No, I don't know. No, okay. Sorry. <laughs> but I'll, I'll chase it up. Yeah. <laughs> Meteora, okay. All right, great. Thank you, everybody. If you have uh, any additional questions, we do have time for one or two more probably, so you can feel free to send those. Um, in the meantime, Tony, I might ask you to tell us uh, where you are with Angels Look Away. I mean, we had this wonderful excerpt that you read during your presentation, but how close are you to publication with that? Uh, well, I, at the moment it's going out to um, prospective publishers, so we haven't got a deal yet. I'm still waiting for that magic email that says done, you know, right. and uh, it's, it's a terrible time for any author at any at any stage of their career and, and I must say it doesn't get easier even after four books uh, with a, an international publisher still very hard to find um, publishers willing to take on difficult subjects it's not an easy subject um, and at the moment the publishing world is in not in turmoil but certainly in chaos you know uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, anticipation about what to do because uh, movies and, and books they have enormously long lead times you know I, if I if I get a deal on this book it's going to be at least 12 months before that book appears in the shops uh, if you start making a film it's going to be at least 12 18 months before it appears in cinemas uh, even the simplest things in movies like do we put people in masks or not masks you know uh, what will be happening in 18 months time vis-a-vis -vis COVID uh, so these, these are very difficult things. Will, will in fact there be cinema audiences? Uh, will everyone be watching at home? Will it all go to Netflix and streaming services without going into cinemas? And, um, and same with books, you know, people, uh, are they looking for literature? Are they looking for serious books? Or are they looking for escapism in this crisis? Very hard. Um, so the, the, sh the short answer is um, uh, it'll be a good year before it appears in the shops, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we do wish you the best of luck with that in the meantime, of course, and there's a great deal of uncertainty everywhere. So yeah. great that you have such a positive attitude about that. Um, so Stephen has another question, which is sort of related to what you were ending by saying. Um, he says, it appears publishers and movie producers want happy stories to balance the misery associated with the pandemic. Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, I think that's in general quite true, Stephen. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's there's been a shift to a lot of uh, animation, uh, a lot of lightness in films, uh, and I can understand that. I mean, people are, are living pretty tough lives. They don't necessarily want to watch suffering day and night on in movies. But on the other hand, I mean, and I think I tried to indicate that in the talk, this is not a bad time to be confronted with some of these very, very powerful ideas about what it is to be human. You know, it's not just about having fun and getting light relief. It's sometimes maybe more beneficial if we dig deeper into ourselves and try to understand what we really want and what we really need and, and, and what we what we treasure. You know, I think all of us probably agree that the world's got too much stuff in it. There's too much consumerism and perhaps for the last 20 or 30 years we've been blind to where we've been taking not only the planet or the world, but even taking ourselves psychologically, you know, into shopping malls rather than into spaces where we might, you know, beneficially think about what, what it really is important to us and what matters. So I don't know, I think, I think you're right. There is, there is a tendency for lightness, but um, let's hope that people can also find some space in their life to, to think about the, the, the more serious aspects of being human. Yeah. 
Thank you, Tony. I couldn't agree more. I've been talking to so many people for whom this has been a real awakening in the sense that they're looking for new directions in their lives or sort of reassessing their values. So I hope that books and art and cinema and all these things we've been talking about can help us along the way doing that. So again, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I will just say a couple more words while I've got everybody in the room. Um, it's been a pleasure to host you, Tony, and it was wonderful to have all of your fantastic questions. So thank you to the audience. Um, I do hope that you will join us uh, for other events this fall. So we're continuing virtually. So the, the full uh, calendar is up through September. At the moment, you can check out our homepage to see any events you might be interested in and go ahead and register for those. Um, just to draw attention to one event, uh, next Wednesday the 16th, we'll be hosting Mamta Chowdhury, who's the author of this wonderful book, Haunting Paris. It's her uh, debut novel. It's just a very, very beautiful tale. Um, you can read more about that online if you're curious. Um, she'll be in conversation with us uh, with Russell Russell Banks. Um, I also wanted to remind everyone that the American Library in Paris is, of course, a nonprofit, and we do welcome donations. So I sent around a link uh, with my with my email, you know, that included the the Zoom meeting link and details. And if you're interested in supporting the library, I do invite you to give it a click. And you know, in person, we generally welcome donations of about ten euros. So anything you anything you would be willing to give would be wonderful as a as a means of support through this unconventional centennial year for us. Um, so thank you again, everybody, for being here. And thank you so much, Tony. Thanks very much. All right. Good evening. <laughs>